Hey, sorry, this episode's a day late. Also, the camera's a bit out of focus because I filmed this after I got off work at 8 in the morning. But whatever, fuck you. I'm dead inside. Watch it! Hey, everyone. Got another whammy for you all today. Now, this review might be a little shorter because this episode was a lot of dialogue, but a lot of great climactic action at the same time. Honestly, don't know where the show's going with all these branches of story development, but... Here's the thing, I'm liking it. I know the payoff will be grand like it was last year. Enough of the disclaimers, let's get right into it. So I know last week we got a huge dose of Greyjoy fuckery, what with Yara getting captured, Theon running away like a coward. But fear not, maybe episode 3 will have a beacon of light for us. No sugarcoating brought our way as we get to see an interestingly heartwarming reunion between the Bastard of Winterfell and the Dwarf of Casterly Rock. Okay, bear with me guys. The next 15 minutes of this episode may be one of the biggest moments of the show in, in its entirety. This may be the first interaction between two major players in the Game of Thrones. Minus the interactions between Varys and Littlefinger, but let's be honest, when was the last time you saw those two together? Although this scene is important, it does seem to throw us for a loop. As Jon and company are welcomed with hostile eyes, they are ordered to relinquish their weapons and Misande escorts them to Daenerys while the dragons soar overhead. Not exactly a beacon of light for a potential alliance, but let's see where this goes. I mean, at least we we have some fun dialogue between Jon and Tyrion, two characters we haven't seen together since the beginning, plus a unique character study for the Red Woman, Melisandre, who knows she'll be a distraction if she stayed. So she departs for Westeros to see it in all of its peaceful country one last time, probably before winter comes for all of it, and the fire from Daenerys' dragons destroys everything in its path. And that's just the first five minutes, you know how I said this was a 15 minute important scene? That's because next up we have a 10 minute interaction between Daenerys and Jon. That's 10 minutes of pure exposition, pure conflict, pure dialogue. And you know what? I have no problem with it. This scene deserves to be stretched out. This truly is a real milestone for the show. Jon and Danny, two characters separated by thousands of miles. And now one is king, one is queen. It's like a job review, but instead of an interviewer and an interviewee, they both are applicants comparing their resumes. Plus some spectacular wingmanning from Davos. He really couldn't give two shits about what's going on in front of him. Even the way he introduces Jon, he doesn't give a shit about his title. He doesn't care that he's King in the North. Just the way he tosses Jon's King of the North title away like a sack of potatoes. Hate to admit it, but the way Davos is acting, I have this feeling there's not going to be a place for him in Season 8. Even if he tops some of the polls for most favorite Game of Thrones character. Varys interrupts the discussion to tell Daenerys about the attack on Yara's fleet, as we cut to a quick catch-up when the Ironborn pull a sickly Theon out of the water. They scold Theon for being a coward even if he tries to explain his situation. And then they all leave, leaving Theon curled on the floor like a fetus. <sighs> even when it seems like he's picked a side, he still doesn't end up on top. This might be the most tragic character I've seen in any show or movie ever. Cut to King's Landing where Euron basks in the praise of the sheeple as he makes his way to the Red Keep. Now we know what he's truly after with Cersei, and yet Cersei continues to deny his offer. Talk about another friend zone situation when she announces that the war will be won with the navy of Euron and the army of her brother Jaime Lannister. Euron brings forth his gift, justice for the death of Cersei's daughter Marcella, as he brings forth Alaria Sand and the last living sand snake, Tyene. Now, I'm a bold man, but I'm also a sympathetic one. And as much as I've despised the Dorne storyline post Oberyn, I couldn't help but feel sorrow for the next five minutes when Cersei tortures Alaria and Tyene in the dungeon. Cersei kisses Tyene with the same poison that was used to kill her daughter, and keeps them both chained up, just barely out of reach of each other waiting for the poison to take effect, leaving Tyene a beautiful corpse and Ilaria to live out her days just sitting across from it. Now as badly as I wanted to see the Sand Snakes and Ilaria dead, this was definitely not the way I wanted them to go. Meanwhile, Jaime gets his just desserts when the Mad Queen starts to go down on him. Even though Jaime tries to politely turn it down, things don't really go the right way. I <laughs> get it, because Jaime's missing his right hand. <laughs> Uh. Anyway, back to Dragonstone, where Tyrion and Jon are brooding over a cliffside. Tyrion advises Jon to talk to Danny about something subpar the Night King. 
which is when John decides to bring up the dragon glass buried beneath Dragonstone. This appears to be John's trump card because Daenerys ends up authorizing the mining of the dragon glass. She continues to dodge her belief of the White Walkers, but this might mean a soft spot is forming between John and Daenerys. Cut to Winterfell where Sansa is really bossing up the place since John put her in charge. Can't say I'm not proud of her, she is probably one of the most strongly developed characters on this show. But I can't help but wonder if that innocent Barbie-esque girl is still hidden away beneath this shell of command that she's formed for herself. This is only enhanced by the fact that Littlefinger is still standing by her side buzzing in her ear, telling her that no matter what happens, she has to look out for herself. Cue the shell of command breaking down when her little brother Bran shows up. Everything's starting to come together. Let's just hope it's not too late before the real action starts. Sansa and Bran sit under the heart tree that's in Winterfell's Godswood when Bran starts to reveal his new three-eyed raven powers. And unintentionally brings back painful memories for Sansa when he reveals he knows about her marriage to Ramsay. <laughs> Awkward. Talk about a Mori Povich episode gone wrong. Meanwhile at the Citadel, Sam and Archmaester Butterman are investigating Jorah's grayscale, or lack thereof. To their surprise and inevitably to mine, it's all completely cured. Butterman kicks Jorah out and he departs for Dragonstone, while Sam gets reprimanded by Butterman for his insubordination. When Butterman asks how Sam was able to succeed, Sam says he did what anyone anywhere wouldn't say when they buy furniture from Ikea. I read the book and followed the Danny is discussing her counterattack against Euron's fleet, and decides she will recklessly fly out there with her three dragons to destroy him. This plan seems to get shelved when the discussion changes to the taking of Casterly Rock, where Tyrion gets to show off more of his intelligence when he reminds Daenerys and the audience of his experience working on the sewers at the rock. Thus begins a visual spectacle that covers the taking of Casterly Rock. And then to my surprise, we get treated to a sack on Highgard in the House of the Tyrells, where Jaime and what appears to be the entire army of King's Landing with Bronn at his side take the castle with complete ease and hardly any resistance. Jamie and Lady Olena break bread one last time before they discuss the terms of Olena's surrender. And then cue the biggest, most flammable mic drop ever to occur on Game of Thrones. Jamie offers Olena a peaceful death when he puts poison in one of the goblets of wine he had poured, and Olena chugs it down like the old cat that she is. Jamie gets ready to depart as Olena prepares to die. But only then does she reveal that she was responsible for the death of his son, Joffrey. <laughs> I know it's not really there, but I can just see the steam eroding off of Jamie's body. But still appears to show plenty of restraint when it looks like he's about to shove his sword down Elena's throat. But he turns towards his own self-respect when he leaves the room, leaving Elena to sit and wait to kick the bucket. Now, this is my problem with most Game of Thrones episodes that appear to be slow and not really going anywhere save for one or two moments. This episode was really dialogue heavy, something that yes, is oftentimes necessary for Game of Thrones, a show with as massive of a world as it is, in order to get all the detail, the story, the character development done right, if it weren't for that whammy of an ending, I would have given this episode much less of a positive rating. But just as I expected, Olena, the Queen of Thorns, sticks one more in Jaime's side with her pre-mortem revelation. And thus with a diss, she dies. For as slow as this episode started out, it was well worth it for the amount of action we got at the end. And I know that 10 minute interaction between Danny and John is going to be up on YouTube and get 10 million views by next week. The pure intentional lack of dialogue during the sackings of Casterly Rock and Highgarden are well worth the viewing. And unlike previous seasons where we got answers for previous events every other episode, we're getting answers for stuff that happened last week. This is something I admire about season 7. There are 4 episodes left, and we've been getting setups for several branches of stories. Now I know we've got a 70 minute episode coming our way, whether that'll be the finale or whatever the episode 9 of this season is going to be. I'm going to take a lucky guess and assume it's going to be episode 6, the penultimate episode of the season. But that is yet to be determined. Still, I'm giving episode 3, The Queen's Justice, 10 out of 10. Would get burned by Olena again. Still waiting for that ultimate payoff, and like a lot of others I bet, I'm still waiting for that wall to come tumbling down. But if they're ramping up stories across the board in a seven episode season, I'm thinking the explosion of events is going to occur very soon and not just in one episode. And I'll tell you one thing, summer's going out with a bang. Thanks again for watching everyone, leave your opinions and perspectives in the comments below, and you know what's coming at you. My name is Matt and I am signing out. Cheers. <laughs>